Good afternoon and welcome to today's Best Production Practices webinar. This is part of our Learn at Lunch series and it is made possible to, due to a grant from the Farm Service Agency. Another component of this grant is the eFarm Management website and I'll paste this link into the chat box in the lower right corner. Please enter any questions into the chat box as well and, and the presenters will answer them at the end of the webinar. Today's speakers are Dr. Lynn Brandenberger and Dr. Josh Lofton and I'm going to turn it over to Lynn now and he will begin the presentation. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me and uh, We'll move forward on this. Uh, Brent asked me a few weeks ago to talk about cover crops and also weed control for vegetable crops. So that's what we'll be discussing this morning or this afternoon. So if we can have the next slide, Brent. One of the things that uh, we need to think about is why would we want to use a cover crop? Well, in the vegetable world, uh, we use a lot of clean tillage and uh, that's kind of what we've done for you know a long long time uh, part of it has to do with the types of crops that we grow uh, when we start talking about something like spinach that might, might be machine harvested uh, we need to have very uh, clean fields we can cannot have crop debris in the field because the machine will pick it up that sort of thing uh, part of it's just uh, tradition that's kind of what we've done um, if you're tilling soil all the time, uh, you're basically fluffing them up, putting a lot of oxygen into them, and so the uh, microbiological organisms that are in the soil that break down organic matter, it's kind of like hitting the turbo on your car. You know, they work even harder and faster when they get all that oxygen. Uh, long story short, uh, most tilled soils in the southern plains that are under conventional tillage systems a half to seven tenths of an organic percent organic matter in those soils which is very very low uh, low organic matter in soil causes all sorts of problems uh, we if we're in a heavier soil we'll have poor drainage uh, we may have poor aeration because what we're trying to do is fill up those pore spaces with some organic matter it creates air space creates places for water to be held in uh, say sandy soils um, and it also holds nutrients if we've got organic matter in the soil so long story short when we have soils that are very low in organic matter we lose out on production of different crops next slide please so cover crops are one way to alleviate or fix this problem I kind of like to call it uh, grown in place organic matter or grow in place organic matter um, you know the great thing about cover crops is you don't you don't have to go uh, get the organic matter to add to the soil you don't have to truck it around you don't have to spread it uh, you don't have any food safety concerns because we're not talking about manure here we're talking about plant material uh, no composting to do because basically the soil will compost this organic matter on its own without your help uh, bottom line it's easier less is involved in it but <laughs> it means that you'll have um, fields that are in cover crops and you cannot grow a cash crop while you're trying to grow a cover crop so you're going to lose out on that income from the field at that point so there's there are pros and cons to any system and that's kind of the con of the the bad part of cover crops is it actually takes a field out of production while the cover crops in the field next slide uh, we've done work for several years on a lot of different cover crops uh, I think we had about four or five years of looking at winter and summer cover crops separately uh, our winter cover crops that we had uh, in that study included uh, winter wheat which would be our grass our annual grass in that system and then we had uh, crimson clover Austrian winter pea as our legumes and then we also did a pea and clover mix in that system um, 
one of the reasons we like to have grasses as part of our cover crop regime is that grasses are fantastic at adding organic matter. They're, they're champions at it. And an annual grass like wheat or uh, cereal rye, uh, hay grazer in the summertime is a great way to add organic matter. But then we like to have lagoons also in the the uh, rotation because lagoons are able to fix nitrogen so it's kind of like free fertilizer. If you wonder whether that really works or not, if you look at that bottom row of pitchers, it would be the second set of pitchers from the left side. Um, we've got the bottom pitcher says pea, clover mix, and then the top pitcher says winter wheat. Now those are pumpkins that were planted uh, in our plots the same day, same variety, and one plot was just winter wheat. And you can see how much growth that winter wheat plot has. And then you look below that at the pea clover mix. And you can see that, guess what? That nitrogen that those lagoons fixed is evident. It's very obvious that we've got a major amount of nitrogen in that soil that's available for that crop because it's growing much faster, much, much more quickly. And in the end, it yielded better. Um, summer cover crops that we've tried, uh, we've tried hay grazer. Uh, this year we were trying a new grass for the summer. We're trying, we tried pearl millet. Uh, didn't see a whole lot of difference at this point. Don't really have data to share, but anyway, uh, either grass works pretty well. Uh, we also tried sesbania, uh, cowpea, and lab lab as our summer lagoon crops. And um, to make a long story short on those lagoons, um, and there are lots of other more exotic uh, summer lagoons that could be used. What we found was that just a good old common forage cowpea like iron clay or, or um, red ripper, something like that, uh, is probably the best because one, it's available locally, it's cheap, uh, and cowpea, you'd think it would Lab Lab would perform just like cowpea, but cowpea makes Lab Lab and Cispania look like wimps. It's very drought tolerant, very heat tolerant. Uh, these other plants will be laying on the ground. They're all um, shriveled up and looking like they're just about to die. And the cowpea's sitting there going, what is wrong with you people? I feel great. Uh, it even makes hay grazer look a little wimpy at times. So it's very tough, and it's a great lagoon for the summer. Next slide, please. So uh, Brent asked me to visit a little bit about uh, managing weeds and vegetable crops. And uh, if you've never thought about how important weed control is, it really is one of the most limiting factors, particularly in vegetable crops. Um, you know, if you can have uh, reasonable control over the weed species that are in your field, uh, you can be successful in vegetable crops. Uh, if you're not able to control the weeds, a lot of times what you do is you just plow the crop up and try again later. So it can get pretty dicey in a hurry. Um, some of the things that ought to be considered uh, when we're trying to manage weeds for vegetable crops is the crop and weed history. In other words, which crops have I grown? Which did I have the most problems with on weeds? What weed species did I have a problem with? And in you know, what time of the year? All that sort of thing is important. The different crop rotations that you might consider in order to rotate out of a weed problem. In other words, can I grow a cover crop or an agronomic crop that will shade the weeds that I'm having trouble with and reduce the amount of weed seed that that the soil would have available to grow weeds the next next crop around. Uh, cover crops, and that's their big, big thing in the summer, is they're able to shade that soil and prevent a lot of other uh, weedy species from growing and producing seed. Uh, selecting crops. And you say, well, what's that got to do with weed management? Well, <laughs> I'm going to give you a Two examples, extreme examples. Uh, the world's worst vegetable crop that we work with as far as weed uh, competition is uh, 
onion. Onion grows vertical. Uh, it, it's in the field for a long time. Uh, the leaves do not shade the soil surface, so it doesn't shade out weedy, weedy species. So that's a big problem for us. Uh, and so you just basically have a battle the whole time you're trying to grow a crop of onions. So if you put a crop of onions in a field that had a lot of weed issues, boy, you would have some serious problems. Uh, the other side of the coin would be something like uh, pumpkin or, uh, let's say, sweet potato. If you can control weeds for 30 days, after that the crop will shade out the ground and you'll have very few weeds to deal with. So the cover, the crop that you actually select to grow has a lot to do with whether you're going to have a lot of weed problems. Uh, irrigation, and we're going to talk about that in a, a little bit more in a minute, but different methods of irrigation will affect the amount of weed problems you'll have. Uh, mulching can help a lot. Uh, cultivation, of course. Uh, there are beneficial organisms uh, that will help the crop uh, to produce and to grow faster and be able to, to get out ahead of the, the weed uh, species that are in the field. And then last but not least, herbicides. So those are kind of some of the management tools we have for vegetable crops. So really, it's, it's like any other pest management system. The first thing you have to do is you have to know what you're dealing with. Uh, you know, what species is it? Uh, at least we'd like to know that we've got henbit, or we've got eclipta, or we've got some wild mustard. What time of the year those particular weeds will be a problem, so we'll know which crops that we might have problems with these weeds. And I might add that if, if we're trying to manage weeds uh, using different types of herbicides, then it's critical that we know which species of weeds we're dealing with because some herbicides control some weeds, some herbicides control others. So it's important to, to know what you're dealing with. So uh, crop rotations and cover crops can help with this. Um, so you want to think about your production system. In other words, uh, you know, am I wanting to uh, no-till uh, cucurbit crops uh, in, the, in the summertime. That's, that's a possibility. Or am I talking about clean tillage system? So that's going to affect the amount of problems or issues that we might have with weeds. The right crop mix. Um, <coughs> if, if you're an onion grower and you've always had a whole lot of weed problems in a particular field, maybe it's time to think about growing it on another field or renting land with uh, fewer of the weed species that you have problems with. That might be a possibility. Or maybe it's time to think about growing some type of agronomic crop which will allow you to clean up a lot of these weedy species either because the crops at a different time and you can clean them out or because you've got herbicides that you can use to control those weeds with. So it, it all depends. Uh, you want to match that field uh, and the rotation. In other words, am I going to rotate out of this crop to the next crop, or am I going to rotate to this cover crop that's going to help me solve some of my weed problems? And then, of course, keeping track of what herbicides have been applied, uh, because we, we can have some carryover um, issues with herbicides, particularly in vegetable crops. So kind of weighing all these advantages, disadvantages, when we're trying to put together a weed control program. Next. So uh, we've kind of already alluded, this, alluded to this a little bit as far as crop selection. Uh, you know, different crops grow at different rates. Uh, they grow to different heights. Their ability to shade the ground is different. Uh, some crops, say like legumes, it looks like we've got a bunch of cowpeas there in that upper uh, pitcher. Uh, you know, we can cultivate something like a bean or a pea um, throughout the season. Whereas if we're talking about something like a pumpkin, you know, we get about a month in there where we can do some light cultivation and after that the crop covers over and we can't cultivate any longer. So that's, that's a difference. And then uh, the ability of that, 
that uh, crop species to compete and tolerate some weeds. Um, you know, it's, I think one of the most interesting things I, I've ever done was we had a um, sweet potato trial one summer. We planted on July the 3rd, which is really late, but it was really, really hot. Sweet potatoes love heat. And so we we transplanted into uh, a field that already had uh, freestanding raised beds with drip irrigation. I think I might have lost four or five slips out of hundreds. So that irrigation really helped. And uh, we did use a pre-emergent herbicide uh, for control of weeds, but you know that only takes you so far. Then, but those sweet potatoes, you know, took them a few days to recover, and then they started growing like crazy. Within a month, you couldn't even find bare soil out there. I think I spent for an area that was probably uh, oh uh, a fifth of an acre. I probably spent 30 to 40 minutes the entire season hoeing, which is nothing. Trust me, that is nothing. Um, so it's all got to do with trying to line a crop up in the in the time it wants to be grown. You know, like you know, if you try to grow sweet potatoes in March, it's just not going to work. Or even sometimes early May, it's not it's not warm enough. Um, and you know, picking a crop that can compete well with the weed weed species that are in the field. Irrigation. There is not, uh, not all irrigation systems are created equal when it comes to uh, weed issues or managing weed species. Uh, if we're pumping water out of, a, out of a water source, a surface water source like in the upper right hand picture there, we're going to pick up a lot of weed seeds. And those weed seeds may come from adjacent fields. They may come from a long ways away. And uh, if we're overhead irrigating, we're sprinkler irrigating, we're basically seeding new weed species into our field. So that, that can be a problem. Uh, if we're flood or furrow irrigating, same, same deal applies. But if we're drip irrigating, even though we're using the same water, we're going to have to run it through a filter system. That filter system will filter out almost all the weed seeds, so we'll reduce the potential for new weed species in the field. Um, so another aspect of this is with overhead irrigation and flood and furrow, basically we're irrigating the entire field surface. Okay, So water is going everywhere, and that means that the weeds that are between the rows are water just as well as the crop. Whereas with drip irrigation, a lot of times we will run one drip tape per row and we're putting the water right down the row so we're not watering all over the entire field and weed species have less of a chance of going totally ballistic on us or crazy uh, um, since we're not watering the entire field. Mulching is another option for weed control. Uh, so basically we're applying a cover over the soil and if that cover uh, reduces the amount of light that hits the soil surface then we can control weeds with that cover. And that would be something like a black plastic or some other type of color plastic. Now clear plastic, trust me, weeds will grow under clear plastic like crazy. They love it. Uh, but black plastic and other different types like infrared transmittable mulches, those sorts of things will reduce the amount of weed problems that we'll have in a field. They'll also help to uh, warm the soil up more in the spring. One of the problems that you need to make, make sure you understand though is if you've got uh, a weedy species and we all know what the, the dreaded uh, nut sedge or nut grass is, uh, Plastic mulch will not help with that at all. That nut sedge will grow right through plastic, no problem at all. Uh, our organic types of mulches, like we show in the upper right hand corner there, uh, are good for weed control, but they're also great uh, for reducing soil temperatures in the summertime. 
Now, you don't want to put an organic mulch down early in the spring when you're trying to get the soils warmed up so you can make your tomatoes grow faster, your vine crops grow faster. But once uh, soil temperatures have come up to, you know, 75, 80 degrees, you can put a mulch on, uh, some type of organic mulch, and it will reduce that soil temperature, which is a big benefit for crop uh, performance. Also saves moisture, just like a plastic mulch will save moisture, and it reduces weed competition because you're shading the ground. You're back to that again. So, Cultivation is the use of mechanical weed control for crops. Uh, this is what we've traditionally done with a lot of vegetable crops. And, uh, you know, it can be a combination of cultivation in herbicides or cultivation in some organic mulches that might follow it. Um, it could be the sole method of weed control. Uh, it could be as, as uh, nice as sitting on a nice big uh, tractor with air conditioned cab and, and uh, cultivating multiple rows at one pass, or it could be as uh, down and dirty as we're, we're out of the tractor cab and we've got our hoe and we're hoeing a row. So that's, that's kind of the way cultivation goes. Herbicides uh, for weed control. Uh, we don't have near the herbicides for vegetable crops as we do for agronomic crops. Uh, part of the reason is, is that ag chemical companies are not really encouraged by vegetable crops, meaning that their vegetable crops are often very sensitive to herbicides, so they might get damaged. Uh, we're talking high value, high risk crops, so if Let's say a chemical company has to buy an acre of vegetables. You say, well, no problem. You know, two or three hundred bucks and you're good. Now, we're talking some vegetable crops. You might have two or three thousand dollars of upfront costs in the crop before you ever get started. So you can see that you would, boy, if a chemical company had to buy very many acres of that, they'd say, well, it's just not worth messing with. And that's kind of what they do. Um, so what's being done about that? Well, we've fortunately USDA figured this out a long time ago that we've got problems with specialty crops, and so they developed uh, the IR4 project, which works with the EPA to help register pesticides for minor use crops like vegetables. And so a lot of times what we're getting is we're getting a, a special local needs label like that 24C there, um, and that website there will show you what uh, 24C labels are available in Oklahoma on vegetable crops. And you can also check the county agent's handbook. Uh, Jim Schreffler uh, and I work together on that most years uh, and try to keep that updated so you know what herbicides are available for vegetable crops, whether that's a pre-emergence or post-emergence herbicide. In conclusion, <laughs> first off, if we're going to control weeds, we need to identify what weeds we're having a problem with. You know, is it a grass? Is it a broadleaf? Is it a cool season weed? Is it a warm season weed? On and on goes the list of questions to ask. And we also need to understand our production system. Are we doing clean tillage? Are we doing reduced tillage? Are we doing no-till? I mean, there's all these things about the production system that will affect uh, we control, and then our control strategy. We really need to look at it from a multiple attack point. You know, we need to look at culturally. What can we do? Can we grow different crops? Can we go to different areas of the field? Uh, biologically, are there uh, organisms in the soil that will help our crops grow faster? Uh, you know, that might be as simple as inoculating uh, lagoon seed with with uh, bacteria to help them fix nitrogen so they'll grow faster. That, that's, that's an example. And then we also have chemical tools that are uh, uh, that we have available to us, particularly if we're conventional farming. Now for organic farming there are a few uh, chemicals uh, that are available to use mostly as burn down materials. Um, you know it could be some type of fatty acid, it could be pelagonic, pelagonic acid, uh, maybe vinegar, those types of things that sometimes are used in organic systems. It could be 
Uh, in our organic system, we could use flame, flame weeding for small weeds. Uh, that, that's a possibility. So there, there's a lot of different ways to approach this. And I think the main thing is to think about all those options rather than just saying, OK, this is the only way I can control weeds. With that, I'll uh, try to answer any questions. Uh, yeah, Demona has asked, is there a website you recommend uh, for help with weed identification? And I believe that we used to, and I would think we still do have, a website here at Oklahoma State. It's within the Plant and Soil Science uh, Department. And uh, on that website, it will help you identify weeds. Um, the other thing that could be done would be taking pictures of weeds and then sending that um, to myself or Josh or, uh, you know, we actually have a weed scientist uh, within our faculty in plant and soil science, uh, uh, Misha. I'm trying to think what Misha's last name. I always have a terrible time with it. But anyway, she's in plant and soil science. Uh, she could help you identify weeds. So there's a lot of us that work on this. Jim Shreffler's good at it. Um, so there's that would be the way to approach weed ID, I would say. So Brent is trying to find this website. OK, there's one for plant identification. Oh, it says weeds. OK, so let's so yeah, amaranth is palmeri, palmer amaranth, right on there, OK? So once you click on that weed, Brent, and see if you can bring up a picture of it. Uh, I guess we can share. Yeah, just, yeah, just, yeah. Just just pick on just click on one, see what comes up. Copper leaf cop uh, hop horn beam. Virginia copper leaf. So you see you got a lot of pictures of it. Um, you know, they'll have it probably depends on the species. Somebody might have a lot of pictures of a species and then just one or two of a, of a different species. But uh, there's several of this one. This shows it in flower and probably starting to set seed. So that would be a good good website to have uh, on your toolbar. Oh, Dr. Misha Manachu Harry Harry. That's our weed scientist. And she's very uh, knowledgeable about weed species. She's helped me just this past summer with some. Uh, of course, I ask everybody as I go down the hall, do you know what this is? <laughs> just start asking questions when I'm not certain. More plants are being added monthly. Okay, great. 